Good afternoon and welcome to your last panel of the day, unless you're on the moot court team. Um, the, the, the title of this panel is called Justice for Detainees Revisited, a Progress Report. It's an optimistic panel, uh, optimistic name anyway, and I think we can decide as the hour wears on whether it's an ironic title or not. I hope not. Um, my name is Faith Gay. I'm a partner at Quinn Emanuel in New York and on the ACS board, and I, I'm a white-collar lawyer. We handle some of these issues uh, surgically from time to time, but I am, I'm not the main event at all. It's our all-star panel here. We are incredibly lucky and happy to have them on a sultry Saturday afternoon. Um, and let me just introduce them briefly. I, I want to get as quickly as possible to substance, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on intros. So I urge you to take a look at the program bulletin because seriously, every person up here uh, is, is an amazing all-star in the field, and, and we're happy to have them here. Let me start. Uh, to my left is Jim Carafano, who is the Assistant Director of the Heritage Foundation's Davis Institute for International Studies, and he's a Senior Research Fellow there as well on Defense and Homeland Security. Uh, before joining the Heritage Foundation, he was in the Army for 25 years. He's a West Point grad. He's taught at West Point. Uh, he rose to the, to the rank of uh, lieutenant colonel. He was also uh, uh, the head speechwriter for the Army's chief of staff, so I expect him to be extraordinarily well-spoken today. Um, <laughs> and he has taught uh, national security interests literally everywhere. Uh, right now he's a visiting professor at the <coughs> National Defense University and at Georgetown. He's written a, a, a ton of fascinating books, the most recent of which is Private Sector, Public Wars, Contracting and Combat, Iran, Afghanistan, and Future Conflicts. Um, I took a, a little look at it last night, and, and it, is, it is completely, it's completely fascinating. Next, next to him is Gene Fidel, who is the president of the National Institute of Military Justice and is a noted expert, of course, on military justice issues. He's also the Rogat Visiting Professor of Law at Yale Law School. Uh, he has a distinguished law practice as well. He's been a judge advocate in the Coast Guard. And in private practice, he has represented every arm of the, you know, every branch of the armed services. He's also written extensively on military law and has taught the subject at Yale and Harvard. He's at Yale now. He's also teaching admiralty next year, something <laughs> that we all need to know about and probably none of us know enough about. Um, anyway, ne next to Jean is Deborah Perlstein who is at the Woodrow Wilson School for Public and International Affairs. Uh, she's an expert in U.S. constitutional law, and her work is focused so far on U.S. counterterrorism and national security policies. Uh, she clerked for Judge Boudin on the First Circuit and then for Justice Stevens. Uh, she also served as the founding director of the Law and Security Program at Human Rights First. And among other projects while she was there, she led the organization's first mission to Guantanamo. And finally, uh, at the end, John Hafetz, who is an attorney with the ACLU, the National Security Project. He's litigated <coughs> numerous post-9-11 detention cases, including most recently, most notably, Almari. Uh, he's also represented detainees held at Guantanamo and uh, as well as, as those in Iraq. He's the co-editor of the Guantanamo Lawyers Inside a Prison, Outside the Law. And before taking up his current post, he served at the Brennan Center any clerk for Judge Rakoff in the Southern District of New York and uh, Judge Lynch in the First Circuit. We're going to have, as I said, an informal format. Uh, at the end is going to be free-flowing questions from all of you, so you might want to take a note or two. Uh, we're going to save plenty of time for that. Prior to that, I'm going to have a few questions for the panel. And to start off, we're going to hear uh, uh, a brief bit from each panelist on topics they've chosen. I think, John, you're going to start with a little bit of a litigation update for us. Thank you very much, Faith, and I um, uh, want to thank ACS um, um, uh, and everyone else who uh, helped put this together. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming um, to this uh, <coughs> afternoon panel uh, on a Saturday. Um, so uh, when President Obama, um, uh, in his inaugura uh, inaugural address, um, it said, so as Americans, uh, we're very encouraged to hear him say, so as Americans, we reject the false choice between our security and our ideals. Um, we can, we must, and we will uh, protect both. 
uh, it was encouraging to, to hear this 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 uh, sign of change that um, they were, we were going to move towards what we hoped was a um, uh, a more rights respecting national security policy. Uh, and um, almost immediately thereafter, there were a, a couple of very important steps taken in that direction. President Obama ordered the closure of Guantanamo <coughs> Prison, where at that time about 250 um, detainees remained within a year. Um, ended, um, uh, you know, the use of harsh interrogation me measures by um, limiting uh, the CIA um, to the uh, in interrogation methods set out in the Army Field Manual, uh, and also suspended the military commissions. Um, since then, um, we've what, what's really been going on is to try to see how much um, uh, actual change there is beneath some of these kind of lofty goals and um, some of the rhetoric and kind of the broader uh, the broader vision President Obama outlined, and I think. Um, you know, from um, uh, my perspective, uh, uh, it, it's been, you know, it's somewhat of, uh, disappointing. Um, and I'll go into some of those details, and in particular how the, the way the, det the detainee policies have been hammered out in terms of the, the ongoing litigation. Uh, one of the first uh, earliest, uh, or the earliest test cases for um, the, the new administration was the Elmari case that I litigated that uh, Faith mentioned. Uh, uh, Ali Almari is a, a Qatari national who was arrested in the United States um, and was uh, was a lawful resident and was declared an enemy combatant in June of 2003 and held in a military brig in South Carolina. Uh, since then, uh, for a good deal of that period, totally incommunicado. Uh, his case raised one of the most uh, important questions, I think, in the entire. Uh, so-called war on terror and a, a question which had not, you know, shockingly not been addressed by the Supreme Court. Um, the question is, you know, who is a combatant? How far um, um, does the military's power to detain uh, terrorist suspects reach? All the Supreme Court had said uh, thus far, um, we're already in 2009, really eight years uh, into the, the so-called war on terror was that the, the uh, president or the government could detain a uh, a soldier who was captured on a battlefield in Afghanistan where he was fighting against the U.S., uh, really a relatively uh, non-controversial proposition. Uh, the, the case had come up, the issue had come up before to the Supreme Court in the, in, in the uh, case of Jose Padilla, the American citizen who was arrested at uh, Chicago's O'Hare Airport, um, but before the Supreme Court could act on his, uh, his petition for certiorari in um, 2005, the uh, Bush administration indicted him in federal court and moved him out of uh, military custody and, and the Supreme Court ultimately declined to hear the case. Uh, well, the Amari case had reached the court, uh, granted, the court granted certiorari in December of 2008 um, to hear basically this fundamental issue of does the president have the power to see someone not just off the battlefield but someone within the United, in the United States, living in the United States and hold them indefinitely as an enemy combatant. Um, and, you know, for the Obama administration, it was, uh, you know, it, it, an important moment. I mean, would they continue to defend this very, very aggressive view of executive power, defend a position that, um, uh, well, in my opinion, was going to be a losing position in the Supreme Court, uh, or would they, or, you know, how would they, or would they do something else? And, you know, uh, what, and the real question was, you know, would this be, would what, would, uh, would what the Obama administration do mark a change? And, uh, what happened was after, um, uh, you know, before the government's <coughs> brief was due, they, uh, they indicted uh, Mr. Almari in the Central District of Illinois on uh, material support for terrorism charges and sought to transfer him there. Uh, the, the indictment ended up um, effectively mooting the Supreme Court case. The uh, lower court opinion um, narrowly upholding his detention was vacated, and he was transferred to uh, civilian custody. Uh, he subsequently pled guilty to one count um, of material support for terrorism and uh, faces a maximum of uh, 15 years in prison and uh, will be sentenced, uh, there'll be a sentencing proceeding later in the year. Um, so, uh, you know, in this, in this, at this moment, the question was, you know, was this just a, uh, an effort to avoid, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court review or avoid taking a position in the Supreme Court, uh, or was this a change in, in policy? Was there a real change behind this that, the administration was going to now, the new administration was not going to treat terrorism suspects through a military war on terror paradigm, was going, but was going to do 
uh, as I believe the, the, the government should and must do, is to treat them as, uh, as, as criminal defendants um, uh, and subject them to su uh, civilian process. Um, well, the answer has kind of been, uh, has kind of played out in um, the, uh, in the litigation uh, that's been proceeding in the Guantanamo detainee cases. Uh, subsequently uh, to um, transferring Mr. Almari to civilian custody, um, the administration filed a, a brief in the Guantanamo detainee cases where it continued to assert uh, the power to hold uh, individuals um, uh, as uh, in military detention um, and a power that was not limited to the battlefield. Uh, it slightly modified the, the prior uh, detention power. Uh, it dropped the use of the term enemy combatant, although I think this was just a completely cosmetic change. Um, and it also said that the individual um, uh, support for uh, al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated uh, forces had to be uh, substantial. Um, so it was signaling that it uh, wasn't going to claim, as the Bush administration had claimed, that it could uh, lock up, uh, you know, little old ladies in Switzerland who unwittingly had sent checks to uh, a charity or al-Qaeda, not knowing that the organization was a charity. But it was, uh, I think, in, in, in large part, um, a, an acceptance of the, um, the war on terror uh, military detention paradigm and the idea of being able to hold uh, terrorism suspects and other individuals captured outside the, uh, or away from a battlefield indefinitely without criminal process. Um, in addition, um, the, um, the Obama administration uh, subsequently uh, revived uh, the uh, military uh, commissions uh, has said that the military commissions are a, uh, a viable option, um, uh, and uh, it's unclear uh, exactly what or how they will use the military commissions. But the fear is that they will they will they are reviving what is a, a really a, a failed and flawed system, and will continue to use will use military commissions to prosecute offenses that should be prosecuted in uh, in federal court. Um, meanwhile, in the habeas corpus cases uh, that are ongoing as the Obama administration formulates its policies, um, they, uh, you know, there are continued challenges both to the detention authority uh, and to the factual basis or the allegations the government puts in support um, of its claimed power to hold people. I think um, to sum up, I mean, by and large, the district judges have um, generally so far accepted the idea that there is a detention power um, that extends beyond the battlefield, um, but they've given uh, a narrower reading to that power than um, the uh, Obama administration has put forward in terms of the nexus that the individual uh, has to have and the degree of involvement uh, that individual has to have in, uh, in, uh, in, in terrorist activity. Uh, and as to the actual factual allegations um, that the government has put forward to uh, defend the detentions at Guantanamo, um, the district judges have by and large rejected um, the, the, the government's assertions. In uh, a recent estimate, 25, in 25 out of 30 uh, of the cases that had proceeded to uh, judgment on the merits in the district court habeas cases that have been ongoing since the Supreme Court's Boumediene decision last June saying Guantanamo detainees had a constitutional right to habeas corpus review. Uh, in, 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 in 25 out of the 30 cases, um, the, the government has, uh, has, has lost and the judges have you know, rejected the, the claims, uh, the government's claim the individuals can be held uh, as uh, you know, enemy combatants or whatever um, uh, the administration is calling them um, and has um, it said there's no basis to hold them. Um, one of the problems and one of the other big issues that's come up is uh, what the power, the remedy is for uh, illegal detention. Uh, this has come up in the case of most notably of the Uyghurs. They're a group of uh, Chinese Muslims from uh, northwestern uh, China who persecuted there, can't be sent back to China, uh, were basically conceitedly picked up by mistake, have been imprisoned at Guantanamo for years. And uh, they can't be sent back. It's the question is, you know, uh, what happens to them and what the current law is. Um, the D.C. Circuit and the D.C. Circuit is that the judge has no power to order their release. The judge can't order the United States to send them to a, a foreign country. Uh, but more importantly, the judge can't order the United States or the executive to release them 
uh, within the United States. So uh, they're basically you know, stuck at Guantanamo uh, for however long it may take to find a place to send you, even if you're totally innocent, uh, and that even if you spend the rest of your life uh, at Guantanamo. This, is, um, this issue is now before the, the Supreme Court um, on a petition for certiorari. It's, uh, it's going to be considered uh, later this month. Uh, I forget the date, but it's, I think it's th at the court's last uh, conference this month. Four of the Uyghurs were recently um, repatriated to Bermuda, um, where you can you know, see pictures of them uh, swimming and doing other uh, you know, totally innocent activities. Uh, and uh, there, there's talk of Pulau uh, also taking some in. So again, I think we may have, you know, again, this may be a, a case where I think where the Obama administration may try to avoid um, a Supreme Court ruling by um, uh, trying to address the problem of the Uyghurs, um, but the, the lingering problem will remain uh, in the habeas corpus litigation where you can win the battle um, and convince the judge that the government has no evidence um, and there's no basis to hold you, but lose the war uh, if there's, uh, you know, no place the government can send you um, uh, because the, the United States does not want you here. Um, so, so, John, it sounds like one fair characterization of what you're saying is, you know, maybe we have uh, a third term now, of, but it, you could call it Bush light. Um, <laughs> Deborah, do you agree with that? I mean, what's your current view of the state of, of detainee policy? Do you see legislation coming forward that softens uh, what was going on in the Bush administration or actually tries to, to continue it? What's your view? Um, well, I guess I'd resist the characterization of Obama's Bush light um, for multiple reasons, including, you know, and I think there's a, there's a trope now sort of making its way through, you know, Federalist Society circles and others. Um, that that embraces that characterization, and I think you know what they're doing. Among other problems, what they're doing is comparing what Obama's done in his first 125 days with where Bush policy stood on January 19, 2009, um, and embracing uh, policy on January 19, 2009, as if this was the policy of the Bush administration. Um, but the facts on the ground, both with respect to detention policy and, and interrogation policy and so forth, by that point had been entirely shaped and indeed forced upon the Bush administration by, you know, seven years' worth of litigation, legislation, advocacy, uh, work by civil society, um, investigative reporting, and so forth. So I think there's I, – I think I would really chafe against the appropriate comparison being – well, you know, we've gotten this far already, uh, or, or Bush was really doing exactly what Obama was doing. Um, by, the, by 2009, um, policy had changed radically in part as a result of the work that Jonathan and a lot of others here had done. So um, I want to guess just set that as a baseline. Um, beyond that, you know, I think we talked about – I sort of describe a little bit what has happened on the policy side. Um, Jonathan talked about the courts. And there's obviously also been a lot of activity uh, going on since Obama took office outside of the courts. Um, and in particular, I want to um, sort of just give a little bit of, of <coughs> charting what's happened in the last few months. Um, when Obama took office, of course, he issued a series of executive orders on these um, issues. Two of them are centrally important to the uh, detainee question. And in addition to announcing the closure of Guantanamo by January of next year, um, the administration by executive order created two essentially policy task forces. Um, and they created two separate task forces, I think in part as a result, as a reflection of the way they were, at least at the time, conceiving of how they needed to deal with detainee issues. They created one task force that would deal with the problem, and the president's called it, I think, quite appropriately, mess, uh, that is Guantanamo Bay and how we are going to handle the closure of that facility and, and, and the um, – resolution of these detainees cases, and a second separate task force to deal with detention policies sort of writ large going forward if we are going to be engaging in counterterrorism operations worldwide, what kind of detention authority do we need? Um, and these were the two task forces that were created with, you know, interagency membership uh, and participation and with, with really different, I think, mandates. Um, the Guantanamo task force has been proceeding uh, apace, and I think since um, Obama's come to office, there have been something like 12 additional releases or other 
dispositions of the case, one individual transferred to the United States for a criminal trial, um, leaving about 229 people at Guantanamo. Um, they are literally going case by case. The Attorney General testified to Congress this week that they've now been through about half um, of the cases uh, and are making decisions in a, in a really case by case way about you know what's the best thing to do with these individuals. I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Um, the detention task force has also been proceeding in its work, and they've been holding a number of meetings with human rights groups and uh, also advocates of national security courts and a wide range of uh, you know individuals with a wide range of views. And I think hearing hearing those views, um, as created by the president in January, that task force has a deadline of July for issuing a report about. Um, uh, what they recommend with respect to detention policy sort of writ large and going forward. Um, so that was, I think, the initial plan. Um, I think, and I actually think that was the right plan. Um, and then Congress, among others, started getting antsy. Now, this is certainly my own characterization of, of sort of how things unfolded and, and um, uh, you know, I'm hardly omniscient, um, but my, my impression is that um, starting in May and a little bit before, the administration started getting hit hard, both from the right and the left, on what actually was going on in these task forces and with Guantanamo. Uh, from the right, a lot of hits about, are you really going to close this facility? Does that make sense? Vice President Cheney on a sort of universal speaking tour um, talking about this, large advertising campaigns about these people are going to come to the United States and you know move into your neighborhood. and set up a shop across the street making bombs or whatever it was. Um, and, and then, uh, and in part response to that, a vote in Congress um, by 90 to 6 on, uh, to, to, by 90 to 6, this is the democratically controlled Congress, um, not allowing the administration, the funding, the some millions of dollars it had sought to effectuate the closing of Guantanamo Bay. And I think um, in, in part, I would characterize this as a, you know, a little bit losing control of the political um, messaging that's required, uh, that, that I think is required to be associated with effective closing of, of Guantanamo. And uh, the administration had a couple of very hard shots fired across its bow um, by its allies in Congress saying, if you're going to do this, we want to know now exactly what you're going to do before you ask for money and so forth. Um, and that has brought about something of a shift my impression is uh, something of a shift uh, in what the administration is, is doing and how it's proceeding. And in part, um, what we saw, I think, really quite in reaction to the shifting political dynamic was the president's speech at the National Archives on May 21st uh, of this year uh, that I think was not so much I think was a statement of the administration's policy indeed before the administration had come to closure internally on what um, its detention policy was going to be. Uh, litigation uh, positions notwithstanding, and we'll come back and talk about that a little bit more. And in his speech, um, the president said a lot, it was a eloquent, uh, a characteristically eloquent speech that in many respects took these issues head on, and I commend it to everyone's attention if you haven't heard it. Um, but in these issues, he said um, a couple of things that I think were particularly critical. The first is um, he said, uh, going forward with respect to the closure of Guantanamo, we're going to be talking about five different types of detainees. Um, category one are people who can be tried criminally, and we've seen one transferred. I think everybody expects that there will be more criminal trials in, in uh, Article Three. Uh, courts here in the U.S. Um, that's category one. Category two, and I know Jean's going to talk more about this, are people who can be tried by military commissions, um, re revised military commissions, and the administration announced some regulatory changes it was making in the rules. I think um, uh, my understanding is there is legislation being drafted, and I think we may see uh, additional efforts to revise, amend those procedures uh, coming through Congress, a big question, uh, if that is the only legislation we see, uh, is whether and to what extent it can hold off other efforts on the Hill to attach um, less progressive uh, amendments to the military commission process. So that's a, that's a second category, and we'll talk more about that as well uh, with Jean in the Q&A. Um, a third category the President distinguished uh, was a category of detainees who have been ordered released by courts. Now this, um, I think, it, the president is quite right. The courts have said, uh, you know, I guess the statistics are 25 out of 30 so far. Uh, these people don't fit even the standards that the court 
uh, the courts have held uh, they need to under the authorization for the use of military force. Um, uh, and I should add, just from a political point of view, it gives the administration, I think, some very useful political cover uh, from the right and the left to be able to say the courts have now ordered us um, to, to release these people, and, and now the task is what are we going to do, but effectively we have no choice. Um, category four uh, were detainees who can be safely transferred, um, and the Bush administration and now the Obama administration have identified something in the neighborhood of 50 or more detainees who are eligible for transfer, either because they never should have been there in the first place or they're no longer a danger or what have you. And you see very, very active diplomatic efforts ongoing now with Bermuda, Palau, uh, Europe, and, and so forth around the world about where these people can be can be placed in a very active effort and now studies of that effort in Saudi Arabia of a sort of um, terrorist rehabilitation program uh, and re-education program that is uh, something of a halfway house for some of the people who, who are being released from, from Guantanamo. So that's category four. And then the president said, um, and I want to quote the words because instead of just saying, you know, people who can be tried criminally, people who can be tried before military commissions, people who can be, uh, people who have been ordered released. Uh, the president said category five is, quote, the question of detainees at Guantanamo who cannot be prosecuted yet, yet who pose a clear danger to the American people. And I think it's, it's critical to sort of quote this uh, paragraph of his speech in detail because it's, um, because it's been the subject of such controversy as, as well it should be. The president said, there may be a number of people who cannot be prosecuted for past crimes, in some cases because evidence may be tainted, but who nonetheless pose a threat to the security of the United States. Examples of that threat include people who've received extensive explosive trainings at an al-Qaeda training camp, or who commanded Taliban troops in battle, or who expressed their, allegiances, their allegiance to Osama bin Laden, or otherwise made it clear that they want to kill Americans. These are people who, in effect, remain at war with the United States. If and when we determine that the United States must hold individuals to keep them from carrying out an act of war, we will do so within a system that involves judicial and congressional oversight. I think um, there are a number of things that are important to note about this uh, passage and this statement of, the, of current administration policy, which I think is the clearest statement we currently have. Um, one is it's filled with equivocations. This is a speech written by lawyers and delivered by a lawyer, uh, and it should be read by lawyers um, with the attention that it deserves. There is a lot of may and if and when we decide, and with respect to the people at Guantanamo and, and, and qualifications on this. And I think I, my overwhelming impression from talking with people inside the administration and out is this is a very active develop, uh, area of policy deliberation internally in which um, decisions have not yet come to rest. Uh, so I think that's an accurate characterization of where, uh, in which not all decisions have, have yet come to rest. Um, the second thing is, let's just to take a closer look at um, the categories the president identifies. And here I'll just do this very briefly and again hope to come back to it at Q&A. We will. Um, <laughs> is there a fifth category, or some people say a third category, whatever. Is there this can't be tried, can't be released, uh, and yet need to be d detained? Well, I guess I would say um, to some extent, yes. Uh, and here's the limited extent to which I think this is the case. The president named people who have commanded Taliban troops in battle. Now, these are people who under um, the traditional law of war are detainable by the United States. Um, the Supreme Court in Hamdi in 2004 recognized by a vote of five to four that the authorization for the use of military force Congress passed in 2001 authorized the detention at least of this set of people who had been picked up in Afghanistan. Um, so if, for example, preventive detention legislation that might be coming down the pike is designed to somehow regulate, provide more procedures for uh, the people we are currently detaining uh, in Afghanistan in the course of that armed conflict, then it's not clear to me, modulo, what that legislation is actually likely to look like once it gets through Congress. It's not clear to me that in policy inspiration that is a bad thing. Um, so that's one category, and I think it's, it's worth at least noting and recognizing, in my view, the, the sort of long-standing legality of, of that category of people. What about people who've received explosive training at an al-Qaeda training camp? Well, 
In 2004, Congress passed a law criminalizing that conduct, and it is a criminal law that extends extraterritorially. So going forward, Congress has made clear we intend to handle those guys through the criminal justice system. What about the guy who was picked up in 2001 when, that, when he had done that conduct that was not yet criminal? Can't, of course, prosecute him now without running afoul of the ex post facto clause. Do we release that guy? Um, this, to me, is, a, if I were President Obama, a difficult call. And in the meantime, you have courts who are saying that guy is probably detainable under existing authorization for the use of military force uh, authority. Do you press that litigation case in court, or do you just let him go? In, in which case, where, uh, who do you, where do you send him? Uh, clearly, I, I would imagine not to the United States. And finally, people who've expressed their allegiance to. Um, Osama bin Laden. This, I think, is by far the most complicated category, the category we're going to be talking about going forward, the category that's the subject of the most active litigation. Uh, here, I think the question is, is quite a bit more complex. And in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop and hope for the opportunity to, to, to say a bit more. Thanks very much. Now, now, Jean, before we get to category three or category five, or whether uh, the, the Obama administration is already about to run a, a foul of the current Supreme Court, tell us a little bit about why the, the system of military justice is relevant at all at this point. Uh, we, we heard last night that there's obviously new procedural protections promised. Deborah alluded to that. Uh, less, less hearsay evidence, better counsel, more transparency, whatever that means. But we, don't, we haven't seen skin on the bones yet. Why, why, why not just turn it over to the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Article Three judges at this point, the, the, broad, the broad category of at least, at least the current residents of Gitmo? Right. Well, uh, t two comments. Uh, in direct answer to your question, uh, my view has been for a number of years now that anyone who can be tried in an Article III court should be tried in an Article III court. So um, uh, I have a quite easy solution to uh, what seems to be a terrible quandary for the administration. So that's, that's on one level. Uh, on another level, I think it is desirable to uh, have at least some sense of what's going on in what I'll call classical military justice, because you can't understand the military commission's option uh, without having, you know, without knowing the uh, sort of more fundamental program, which is the administration of justice within the armed forces and now uh, um, against uh, U.S. civilians uh, overseas. Uh, so uh, if, if I can, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, make a few incendiary comments on that subject. Excellent. Okay. Um, I uh, really am uh, enormously uh, discouraged by uh, the uh, landscape that we're confronting uh, with regard to the more fundamental field that I talked about, the military justice system, uh, uh, and also, therefore, with what I see as the landscape relating to the first cousin of that military, uh, that military justice system, namely the administration of justice through military commissions. Uh, I'll start with the executive branch. Uh, there, it, it's been said that, uh, you know, that, that jokingly that the uh, Obama administration is, uh, is uh, President Bush's third term. I, I, that's silly. Uh, that's clearly not the case. Uh, however, uh, there are uh, disturbing aspects to the way the administration has proceeded. And uh, just to give you a, a brief illustration, uh, they seem to have uh, a practice now uh, of performing outreach after they've made decisions. Uh, those of us who have been involved in consultations regarding, you know, what the government's policy ought to be have on a number of occasions been uh, baffled to find out that in the interval between being invited to a meeting here, there, or everywhere, uh, th there's a news report like 48 hours before your planned big meeting announcing the decision about which one thought one was being consulted. So this is not so terrific, and it's not in, uh, consistent with the President's uh, position with regard to transparency. Um, the President did announce, as uh, Deborah mentioned, uh, some changes relating to military commissions. Um, uh, it's true that he, 
he did. Uh, some of these may also require legislation, and that seems to be in the works, and I'll get to the legislative piece of it in a minute. But the, the changes that he's proposed for the military commission system are pretty much window dressing. Uh, are they improvements? Yes. Are they modest? Very. Uh, and we can talk about details, but just that's the, the headline on that. Moving right along, um, the, the uh, situation on Capitol Hill is truly grim. And uh, um, is there anyone here from New York? Yes. Uh, Chorus of eyes. Uh, <laughs> our legislature, Congress, uh, makes the New York State Senate look good. <laughs> I mean, we are in a terrible uh, pickle when it comes to uh, uh, how Congress has been behaving, not only in this area, but in other areas where, you know, uh, support for the uh, president is desperately needed. I'm thinking about uh, Elizabeth's uh, comments to some extent uh, over lunch. Um, to, to get real uh, specific, uh, a word about um, Congress's leading expert on military justice. I'm referring to Senator Lindsey Graham. Uh, no, no, don't laugh. He is Congress's leading expert on military justice. Uh, what you won't hear, however, is the fact that even though he is an, uh, a colonel and uh, a, a lawyer, uh, and indeed has served as a judge advocate and military judge, um, uh, because he was tone deaf to the demands of something called the incompatibility clause, you remember that from con law, where you can't hold two different offices at the same time, uh, he served simultaneously in the U.S. Senate and on the Air Force's intermediate court, and because he violated the Constitution, several uh, perfectly valid convictions had to be set aside. So that is the one-eyed man uh, who is, uh, you know, Congress's leading expert on military justice. Um, uh, obviously, uh, it is uh, very discouraging uh, uh, on the Hill. Uh, the w w one piece of business that uh, Congress is grappling with is quite interesting, and it, it, show, it, it has an aspect that uh, uh, suggests the interaction between the laws relates to internal discipline of our forces, which is a whole other topic. How good a job have we done at enforcing discipline and punishing the guilty within the armed forces? Uh, think Abu Ghraib, uh, and on the other hand, the military commissions. Specifically, uh, since 1983, uh, the law has been that the Supreme Court could review court-martial decisions directly on writ of certiorari. It had never been done before. It had to be done by habeas corpus or cases in the Court of Claims under the Tucker Act. Um, when Congress passed that legislation, it put a little clause in, thanks to the Pentagon. Uh, and by the way, there is much less difference from Pentagon to Pentagon between administrations than you might think. The elements, and those who have worked in the government will, I'm sure, be familiar with this, the elements of continuity in executive branch policy far outweigh the elements of change, even when there's a new administration and even when a new administration is from the other party. When Congress created the, the, or extended the certiorari jurisdiction in 1983, it said the GIs could take cases to the Supreme Court unless the lower court, the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, denied review itself. In other words, they have a certiorari practice, and most of their jurisdiction is, is uh, certiorari style. The effect of this has been that most court martial cases are never even eligible for Supreme Court review because most certiorari petitions at that intermediate level get denied. Contrast this with the uh, arrangements in um, military commissions. Any military commission defendant can go from the D.C. Circuit to the Supreme Court. There is no similar gatekeeper function. Uh, by the way, w why the D.C. Circuit has that jurisdiction over military commissions rather than the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces is a mystery, probably because they thought the D.C. Circuit was even more trustworthy than the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. And think about the implications of that. Um, now, that legislation has been repeatedly introduced and uh, 
it seems to be um, in grave danger. Why is it in grave danger? Because a senator named Lindsey Graham has opposed it and has told everybody in sight he's not going to support it. Uh, so, uh, so much for uh, Congress. By the way, Congress hasn't held any substantive hearings on military justice since 1982. Okay. Uh, as a result of that, the NGO I had, the National Institute of Military Justice, NIMJ.org, uh, has commissioned its own forum for conducting hearings called the Cox Commission, chaired by Chief Judge Walter Cox of the Armed Forces Court, now retired, uh, which uh, conducted a public hearing, something Congress hasn't done, as I said, uh, last week at uh, GW Law School. And uh, later this summer, we'll have a report from the Cox Commission, very estimable, estimable group of people, um, and the report will uh, perhaps shed some light on some of the current issues. Now, very quickly, uh, how does it look on the judicial front? Uh, John and Deborah uh, discussed this to some extent. Um, uh, from my perspective, we are really in serious trouble to have to rely on the current Supreme Court for anything. And I will give you the illustration. Uh, I recently was second chair on a case called Donetto against the U.S. And I'll try to make this as quick as possible. Uh, the question in Donetto against the U.S. was, do the military courts have power under the All Writs Act or otherwise to grant post-conviction relief. Simple enough. The, the underlying the case was the Neto uh, was a uh, Nigerian national who had uh, pleaded guilty in a court-martial to some financial uh, misdoings, larceny of some kind. Um, and he pleaded guilty based on the express advice of his lawyer that um, doing so would not expose him to deportation. Okay. His conviction becomes final. Six years elapsed. Why do I mention that? Because six years is the period of limitation for bringing an action in federal district court against the United States or suing the government under the Tucker Act. He therefore had no remedy other than uh, a writ of error quorum nobis. What does the Supreme Court do? That question, which one would have thought is a no-brainer, uh, the Supreme Court answered correctly by a vote of five to four. Five to four on a no-brainer. The decision is, the majority decision is by Justice Kennedy. It's basically incoherent. The dissent written by the Chief Justice is worse. The, the dissent says military justice is supposed to be a rough and quick form of justice basically echoing things that had been written long ago and uh, before the major reforms that Congress started to institute in 1950. So this is the United States Supreme Court's latest word on a, the third major system of uh, criminal justice in our country. So if I sound a little down in the mouth, uh, I think it's only realism, but we should know what we're dealing with when you're talking about the judicial branch as well as uh, as well as Congress. Let me stop it there. It's a pretty grim picture, though. So, so Jay, we haven't been hearing a loud shout of, uh, of uh, approval of what's going on with the Obama administration so far or with the courts or with Congress. Uh, what's your view of Obama's proposed plans, even though it's, it's full of lawyer language, as we've all uh, pointed here, and where should we be going from here? Right. Well, I, I have to say I'm really resentful. So I was told my role on the panel was to <laughs> do the counterpoint or rebuttal to the other comments. And so I, I found that very presumptive is that, that I was going to largely disagree with the other comments on the panel. And in fact, there's a lot of things with the other comments on the panel I actually very agree with. So, uh, you know, particularly the title of the panel, which, which I hardly agree with, which is Justice for Detainees. And I would vociferously argue that that, abs that, that, that is fundamental, that that is unquestioned, that, that the one thing you would never sacrifice in any war is that the, the obligation to give justice to anyone. And I have no sympathy for the detainees. I have no empathy for them. But I, I would be the first to lay down my life in that we ought to give them justice. Uh, I, I'm, I guess the one thing where I'm different, where I would differ with the other uh, conclusions of the panelists is I'm actually 
much more sanguine about how things have evolved and, and actually complacent about how things have evolved. And, and there's two reasons for that. One is I, I find it very unsurprising that the law and the debate on this has been evolutionary uh, for two reasons. One is warfare is evolutionary. Warfare changes and is always changing, uh, as is the concept of what is appropriate under law enforcement. Uh, you, I, you know, I think we'll see this most, for example, in the area of cyber war. I think because attribution is so difficult, I don't ever think we're going to be able to adequately take the terms of warfare and apply them to the cyber battlefield. Uh, but we see them here as well, issues of geography, the length of the conflict, the nature of the combatant. Um, so the fact that, that these have been difficult issues to grapple with, I don't find that surprising. I don't find that remarkable. And I actually find that uh, um, acceptable. Uh, the second thing is, uh, is the... Um, the, the open nature of the rules we have to grow with. If you actually look at the U.S. obligations under treaty, they're really statements of principle. Uh, for example, Common Article 3. And, and as we adapt these, it's, uh, the question is, is, do you adapt them in a correct manner? And there it's as much about uh, not questions of legality, but proportionality. What, what's, what's reasonable for our government to do? Because we don't just want our government to do what's legal. We want our government to do things that are reasonable and appropriate. And in the issues of proportionality, that gets into understanding a threat, understanding the nature of risk, and that's been changing and evolving and, 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 and a matter of intelligence and everything else. So it's a, a gray area as well. So the fact that the law has evolved uh, over a time period in ways that people who started out couldn't predict or understand, don't find that remarkable in any way. Um, and the other thing is, is, is unremarkable, I think, in terms of the public debate. And I, I think, you know, Casey and Rifkin termed this time lawfare, which I heartily embrace, which we, I think we've seen a lot of, which is when people didn't like the policy choices that we made, they threw a red flag and they said, oh, this isn't a policy debate, this is a legal issue. And then they proceeded to turn policy arguments into legal debates, and to the point where I think in the public sphere it became almost indistinguishable to figure out when we were actually having an argument over the law and when we were really just debating the policies that the administration was trying to implement. So I would, I would heartily agree um, that uh, this is not Bush light. I think that's a very unfair characterization. But on the other hand, I think what we've seen is really the next step in evolutionary. And, uh, and I would argue that there is more continuity than change, and some people think that's a bad thing, but, I, but, I, but I, it, between the administrations, and again, I think that's understandable because I think what the administration has found once they come in is as the last administration, these are very, very difficult issues. Now, I, I'm act, and I'll just finish up here, I'm actually pretty sanguine about uh, where we are in terms of the, the future of the detainees at Guantanamo. I think there's plenty of revenues for that all to be worked out. I think there are lots of people working very hard on both sides of the argument to, to resolve those things. I'm actually pretty sanguine where we round up on interrogation policies, and I think that will continue to move forward. But I don't think we've actually grappled with the really, really difficult issues yet. Uh, and, and I think these are really the, the unfinished business in the long war that we still have to deal with. And I, I don't really think we have a proper understanding of wartime detention. And I don't think we have a, a proper remedy for preventative detention. I mean, the notion of wartime detention uh, beyond an obviously definable geographical battlefield, I think, is still an unsettled uh, debate in the public's mind, in the Congress's mind, uh, in the law's mind. And, and I do think that that is yet to be codified in an appropriate way. Uh, I, I think the same thing for preventative detention. We did an enormous amount of preventative detention post 9-11 on the material support statute, I think was wildly inappropriate. And I don't think we really learned the lessons of that because I don't think we've come up with vehicles for how we're going to do preventative detention in the future. And I think the argument that we're never going to do preventative detention within the United States for national security concerns just ignores history. Uh, I think both those things to be settled. I think it's it, at the end of the day there has to be a legislative framework to do that, and I think it's got to have four components. There's got to be some kind of trigger uh, that's established in law, that uh, it has to the, it, uh, and a trigger has to come from you know a high sovereign authority. Uh, there has to be some kind of um, clear determination of the limits of detention, whether it's in terms of describing an end state or a time. Uh, there has to be clear statements about the treatment of detainees, uh, and there has to be a clear and obvious process for uh, the review of, of the right of detention and a periodic review of whether somebody should still be detained. But I still think that, that, that the, the, the notion of wartime detention and preventative detention in the United States is these are unsettled issues and we need to settle these things because you know, I think we're all a bit complacent today because you know, we're not feeling a direct threat to the United States that we did post 9-11. Um, but uh, the best time to make these kinds of laws is when the passions are cooled. It's not in the heat of battle. Um, and we're going to face these moments of, of great fear in the future again, and we should not go into them 
without, without good, clear law on when it's legitimate to deter, de, uh, detain somebody for national security concerns. John, a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, uh, again, assuming, uh, d taking what Jay is saying, assuming that we're not just talking about emptying out Guantanamo, is, 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 is there any conception of indefinite detention without process that's consistent with the Constitution? And then following up on Gene's assessment of the Supreme Court, do you find in light of Hamdan, Hamdi, et cetera, that we're headed for, that the Obama administration, if it, conti it continues on the seeming arc it's on, is headed for a showdown with the, with the current Supreme Court? Uh, the answer to your first question is, um, you know, no. Uh, I don't think there's any form of indefinite de detention um, that's consistent with the Constitution. Um, other than, I mean, there's a, there there are limited there are limited forms of, uh, of of detention or really civil commitment that have been upheld, and the civil commitment of individuals who are, um, you know, mentally ill and thus pose a danger to themselves and others. Um, and those individuals can be committed, but that's on the basis of, you know, a long-established, accepted um, uh, basis that they have, they, they, have a, they have an illness and they're being held um, uh, because of that. And it's not a – and it's not because – so it's not preventive detention in the way I think that we're, uh, we're thinking of. It's, it's more of a – it's a sort of, you know, the state acting – um, um, in its capacity to protect the individual as well and, and, and based on the person's illness. The idea, what we're talking about, I think, I, you know, really is we're talking about when you say preventive detention is basically locking people up um, because you think they're thinking bad thought, thoughts or you think they might do something uh, dangerous um, and you're not going to charge them with the crime. Uh, that's, I think, what we're really talking about. That The Supreme Court has never upheld that. The, 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 the closest they came is in one of the is when they upheld the detention uh, uh, the civil commitment of uh, of, of uh, sex offenders, but that again was done that, that was again tied to the fact they had a uh, a mental illness. I think it's unconstitutional to be able to detain someone indefinitely based on the fact that you think they you know might be dangerous, and that goes against really the sort of most basic value I think of our society. I also think it's um, wildly incorrect to think that the criminal justice system is not in itself. Uh, a form of preventive uh, detention. What, it, what, what the criminal justice system does not uh, simply just punish crimes after the fact. And the anti-terrorism laws and related laws are, or the laws used to prosecute terrorism, I should say, are, are, are an example of the way the criminal justice system uh, can be used to disrupt ongoing or, 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 and, and prevent uh, terrorist attacks uh, disrupt ongoing plots before anything happens, whether through uh, the punishment of inchoate offenses, uh, like the material support laws, uh, which I think cover uh, uh, many of the categories Obama uh, had outlined in, his, in the fifth category paragraph of his speech, or through conspiracy laws, uh, or through other laws. Uh, you know, there, there, are, there are many other laws that can be used, even non-terrorism offenses, that can be used to uh, you know, it, it as a way of, of, of preventing uh, terrorist, uh, for, you know, attacks before they occur and, and, and detaining suspected terrorists. It doesn't have to be a terrorism prosecution. Um, there's a, a report written by two federal prosecutors um, with human rights uh, first that, that gives a, a, a very complete um, uh, way of the, the, the both the substantive um, Ability of the criminal law and the, the the ability, the flexibility to deal with the, the you know in terms of evidentiary issues, to terrorism offenses, and how successful um, the criminal courts would be. I just don't think the case has been made that that the, the criminal courts uh, are inad are inadequate. And in fact, the the reason that we went outside the criminal courts uh, after 9/11 really had nothing to do um, with preventive detention, as we talked about. It really had much more to do with um, the desire to use highly coercive interrogation tactics, including torture, um, which would simply not have been possible under the criminal justice framework because, of course, you have access to a court, you have access to a lawyer, so you would not have been able to get away uh, with what was uh, spelled out in the, um, in the Justice Department memos, the torture memos, and which really became, uh, in many ways, trickled down and became uh, really uh, U.S. detention policy. Um, as to your second question, I do think this issue will get back to the Supreme Court, uh, you know, one way or another. If you know, eventually, 
whether through a, um, you know, a Guantanamo detainee case, someone just being indefinitely detained um, outside of the, the limited authority the Supreme Court has uh, found acceptable. Well, you know, eventually it's going to get to the Supreme Court um, uh, if they're held, uh, or uh, if there's some new form of, of legislation and it's, in, you know, invoked or uh, there's a way, to, you know, for it to be challenged, uh, you know, if there's some kind of new system, whether it's a national security court, which has been uh, discussed. The Obama administration, to my knowledge, has not, you know, endorsed any such thing, but it's certainly been, uh, you know, talked about in policy circles, including by individuals who are serving in some capacity within the administration. Uh, you know, eventually it's going to, something passed, it's going to get to the, the Supreme Court. It's going to be litigated. Um, you know, I don't know how it will. Uh, will shake out, but I really think it's something that's, uh, again, I just don't think that's something that's consistent with the Constitution. Yeah, I was just going to say, in response in part to Jay, but, but the general also tenor of the panel, um, I, I was thinking, I, you know, I, it sounds incredibly grim, and I think I want to say, um, in defense of the Obama administration, um, at least two things. One is, um, the decision to close Guantanamo was an extraordinary decision. It was politically courageous and it was legally right and it was strategically in the interest of the United States national security. Um, the, I don't think the administration necessarily understood exactly how politically courageous it would be in part because I don't think um, there was a good preparation of you know, the left and right and Congress um, for the reality that for many of the people at Guantanamo, there is no good outcome. There is no good outcome. What, you know, can you try the guy who you've held for seven years and never Mirandized, um, even if he confesses vigorously to um, some past criminal act um, in federal criminal court? Um, you know, is that statement now? in any sense voluntary after he's been held for seven years at Guantanamo Bay? Is he, you know, um, uh, are we facing speedy trial challenges after seven years that we cannot overcome as a result of decisions made by the past administration for seven years and never addressed? Um, you know, I think it's probably impossible to try that guy successfully in federal criminal court, and this is the guy who says, um, I'm a proud member of Al-Qaeda. Uh, if you let me go, I will make it my mission in life to kill innocent Americans. You know, if you're the president of the United States, it's a tough call uh, what to do with that guy. Either you let him go, and you can't find any country in the world to take him, um, or you make an argument in federal court that I have the authority to detain them for the duration of the conflict, the international armed conflict in Afghanistan under the authorization for the use of military force. None of those outcomes, in my view, is good. But I, uh, so I think it's important to sort of start coming to grips with that. Um, and at the same time, uh, while I certainly think the administration hasn't made every right step in re resolving this so far, um, I want to give credit where credit is due for the initial big and, and right decision that it made. The second thing I want to say in terms, of, in terms of credit giving is the categorical difference, one of many, between the eight years of Bush and the, what we've seen in the 125 days of Obama is the view of executive power. Um, a view of executive power in the last administration as simply unconstrained by law period, um, that were claims that that administration continued to make until the day it les left office, and a uh, claim by this administration and a position reflected in I think every brief it's filed that there is no unlimited power under Article 2 to do essentially whatever the President wants under the Constitution, and that there is no, uh, I want to accept the state secrets from that category, that's a really, uh, <laughs> that's a really troubling situation that I think actually is still evolving according to the President's own statements. Uh, he expects to continue to, or to, to relook at that position, uh, which I'm pleased by. But generally, at least in the detainee context, the administration has simply not asserted the Article II claim, um, and I don't think it it's going to. I think the view is that the executive is bound by law and part of the impetus that I find admirable, but I think ultimately misguided as a policy matter, of going to Congress to clarify or seek authorization for the detention of people like this, uh, of some people like the guy I just described, is that we want to put this into law. We want to have all three branches engaged in the policy making here. I think that instinct uh, is the right instinct. It's one that's categorically different from the instinct of the last administration, more in line with, with the vision of the Constitution and the rule of law. Um, that said, uh, and I'll stop here, I think it's the wrong decision. 
um, both as a matter of closing Guantanamo, for which I have enormous sympathy about the options the administration is now facing, and much more clearly with respect to detention policy going forward to go seek new preventive detention authority in the Congress. Gene, it sounds like you think there's no option to just ditch military commissions altogether. But given the, the problems you outlined. No, I think there is. Okay, tell, yeah. us, tell us what the I, answer I, is. I'm not persuaded that there is anybody who uh, we can try who could not be tried in federal district court. I think as a practical matter, the same things that would make a prosecution in district court difficult or possibly impossible if something can be possibly impossible, uh, it applies, th this, those same things would manifest themselves in any military commission that the country was willing to countenance at this time. So it's a wash. And that means that anyone we can prosecute ought to be prosecuted in military commission. And if there are people who literally cannot be prosecuted, let me be the first or last to say it. We may have to just send them home, expel them. And may they make trouble down the road? Yep. And they may wind up dead. Jay, you uh, said we haven't addressed the hard questions. How do we do that? And you, I think you had a response. But, I, but before, before that, I, I did want to just add a footnote to uh, some of the comments. We've, we've also not yet discussed, and maybe there will be questions on this, um, what about something like a truth commission? <laughs> That's a whole other set of issues, and that is uh, in some ways – at least as important as who gets prosecuted for what in which courthouse. And this is a really, really serious issue. And it, no, it doesn't have to do with, uh, you know, rendering legal uh, judgments, uh, but it does have to do with uh, taking stock uh, and applying our national values. Um, do, you, do you generally favor Senator Lay's outline so far for a truth commission? Yes, I do. Uh, I think he deserves great credit for. Uh, uh, taking on a thankless task against the wishes of uh, the president of his party. Do you have a view as to where the immunity should stop there or, wh or what the immunity system ought to look like in a truth commission? I, I, I know people have uh, spilled a lot of ink on this. Uh, I, 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 there's a way to do it. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, who should get immunity? I, for a while I, I prosecuted cases when I was in the service, and there were times when you have to make terrible decisions about who to give immunity to. Uh, and by the way, no one has in mind giving transactional immunity. It's only testimonial immunity anyway. So you're not giving up very much if you give somebody testimonial immunity. If you have something on them, they'll get prosecuted anyway, assuming the, the executive branch is interested in prosecuting. Yeah, well, I did want to actually agree that, I, you know, I would give the Obama administration an enormous amount of credit for moving forward because they're, they're, they're going to get criticism from the right and the left, and they have, and they, ha and they have. And I would give them credit for moving forward as much as not throwing out the baby with the bathwater and, 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 uh, and recognizing that the administration, the Bush administration, um, evolved over time and the laws evolved over time, and they, and they, and they built from there. And, and I do give them a lot of credit. I think announcing the closing of Guantanamo, I don't actually see as an amazingly courageous act. President Bush came very close, and close to announcing the closure of Guantanamo, and, and in the end didn't because he didn't, couldn't really produce a, a, a road map to actually do that, and he didn't want to get the same kind of criticisms President Obama got when he announced the closure of Guantanamo. Uh, you know, the, the closing Guantanamo doesn't really materially change much of anything. You still have to uh, protect the uh, detainees. You still have to make sure that the people that are guarding them are protected and safeguarded. You still have to give them adequate counsel and trial and medical care and everything else. So moving the geography doesn't really change the problem very much. Uh, I, I, the public diplomacy argument here I find in, incredibly uh, really uh, un, un, unconvincing. Uh, the, Guantanamo became a battle cry for, in, in terms of larger foreign policy issues, for a lot of things people didn't like in the world, including Iraq policy. But uh, whether I, I think that actually is, has a very ephemeral impact in terms of uh, the, the argument that well, Guantanamo became a symbol and it helped in radicalization. Well, there's absolutely no proof for that. Uh, you know, we, we, know, we know a lot about extre well, extremists get radicalized. A lot of what we know uh, tells us that we can't sit down and say, oh, that's it. And, you know, how would, would these pay people not have gotten radicalized anyway? So it's kind of an unprovable assertion. And, and if you actually look at the radicalization in the world today and extremism in the world today, the, the trends have actually been trending down since uh, 2000. Uh, um, uh, and three, and, and, and we, we do have some hot spots in places like India and Pakistan. But again, it's an unprovable assertion. 
so the public diplomacy value of closing Guantanamo, I think, is actually pretty ephemeral and pretty useless. Um, and, and I don't think the material has really changed very much. So, you know, it's a you know politically okay decision. You know, does it really change anything? Is it terribly courageous? I really don't think so. Um, I, you know, on, you know, just on the military commissions point, I would say, you know, Congress has given this, has endorsed this form. The government has chosen to use it. Um, you know, it, it, I think that's to me, it's a question of policy choice. It's a question of you know, where do they have to try somebody or not? They, they have this vehicle allowed to them if they so choose to use it and they use it appropriately. I don't really see what the issue there. And, and the point on the Truth Commission, I think, is just fallacious politics. I mean, Truth Commissions were designed for third world countries where people did not have access to knowledge, where the, where the government, where you couldn't get information from the government and the legislature couldn't get information. I mean, we, here we have a Democratic Party that controls both the Congress and the administration. They have access to everything in the universe. We've been investigating this stuff for a year. There, there is no question of not being able to get access to information. So I think a truth commission is really pretty ludicrous. Um, but I, I would go back to the few, and, and of course nobody's in favor of in, indefinite detention, but I, I would go back to the point if we had these issues, which we just haven't answered. How do we not do another thing like we did post 9-11 where we threw a lot of people in jail <coughs> under the pretext of, of um, uh, material support uh, and used uh, immigration things to really do counterterrorist investigations. It was wrong, it was gross, it was huge, uh, and it was uh, inefficient and ineffective. Um, how do we not do that again? Uh, and, uh, you know, what do we do about when we capture a, um, a combatant who is not a state actor, who is not on a traditional geographic battlefield, uh, and the circumstances in which we capture him either preclude the use of evidence uh, that we could try him in a court of law or for some national security reason we don't try him in a court of law. What are we going to do with him? Uh, I think that these are issues that, that – uh, that we should, you know, in a, in a substantive, relaxed, calm, kind of deliberative way without Senator Graham leading the debate, uh, come up with some, uh, you know, responsible legislation. Listen, you hear us talking faster and faster. There's so much we want to get out, and we've barely touched our questions, but let me open it up to the audience. Sir? Do we have a mic? I'm coming to you. Uh, Deborah, just be oh. Deborah, just because you mentioned it and uh, anyone else, what the dickens is going on about state secrets? <laughs> I, I mean, really, what's, the, what's operating within this uh, woodwork? Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, and I thought that the president's statement on it was essentially fraudulent, that uh, he thought he purported to talk, take care of the whole thing with all these reviews and all that stuff. But the obvious question is, what about in-camera review by the judiciary, which does lots of it now? Is there, is there even a political problem with that? I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on with state secrets, except uh, to say that... Um, it's a secret. Yeah. <laughs> except to say that I think it has taken a back seat to what is very actively going on with Guantanamo and everything else. Um, and there is, to some extent, a bandwidth problem. Um, and all I can say is what the administration has said publicly, which is we need to take another look at the position we've taken on state secrets. Um, and my understanding is they are engaged in doing that. But uh, my impression is that it's, you know, it's, it's down here on the list of policy to do items. Sir? Thank you. Shahid Defense. Shahid Buttar at the Bill of Rights Defense Committee. I've got a two-part question that will split into one part, Eugene, Deborah, and Jonathan for you, and the second part, James, and Eugene for you. It's a multiple-part question. It how is indeed. How much time do we have to allocate to this? <laughs> <laughs> the five talk, points talk for the first. Okay, got it. So, you know, we were just talking about the extent to which uh, the, the administration is controlling information, and the State Secrets Protection Act is one attempt to address one piece of that. But there are other contexts in which executive secrecy is a problem, and I'm thinking in particular the photos depicting torture mm -hmm. uh, of detainees at Guantanamo Bay. So the first question is with respect to whether or not torture has actually been repudiated, right? So it's historically been discussed in the context of the enhanced interrogation techniques, waterboarding and the like, but there have been reports of immediate reaction forces, for instance, at Gitmo, the cell extraction units and the force feeding in particular. So the first question, Eudine, Deborah, and Jonathan, for you is whether or not the conduct that remains ongoing at Guantanamo Bay could be appropriately described as torture, despite the administration's attempt to repudiate it in one context. And then the second question, with respect to the photos in particular, 
As I understand it, the principal argument against disclosure is that their release would bring harm to U.S. troops in the theater because it would inspire the recruitment efforts of our, of our enemies. And it, it, does, it does strike me that it's not the disclosure of the photos, but rather the conduct they depict that would really be the intrinsic cause. Well, of, say that again? It's, uh, the, the last part of that? The conduct in the photos. The photos reportedly you know, depict rape by U.S. personnel yeah. of detainees and you know, a whole range of violations that we, we haven't yet seen. And so you know, another context of secrecy here. If, if, in fact, the release of the photos would bring harm to U.S. troops abroad, wouldn't that be an argument in favor of prosecution not covering up the evidence? Well, the answer to that is, the, the, to the latter is, of course. Um, now, the, the first question was, are conditions at Guantanamo currently? Um, I would need to know, I mean, prolonged confinement, actually confinement without limit, uh, I think raises a substantial question. It's like the, 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 the question was presented to the House, no, the Privy Council some years ago about having people under a death sentence for a prolonged period of time. That, that uh, you know, that sort of resonates with that for me. Um, we have supermax prisons that are clearly worse than Guantanamo. That, that at least is my impression. I mean, prisons that kill the brain and kill the spirit, uh, that strikes me as torture. Mm -hmm. Whether, and others on the panel may have a different take on this, whether current conditions at Guantanamo uh, without more, and leaving aside the question of open-ended detention, uh, rise to the level of torture, I, I'm not willing to opine at this, at this point. I just... Um, I, I, for one thing, I don't think that's that question. The answer to that question uh, drives policy on Guantanamo. I think Guantanamo has got to be closed sooner rather than later, even if it was like a Hilton, uh, because Guantanamo has a secondary meaning that is extremely potent around the world. And you know, why would we, you know, uh, it, it have a self-inflicted wound? like this at a time when we need all the friends we can get. Um, so I, I guess I don't reach that, that question, but I'd be interested in knowing what John and Deborah and, and Jay uh, think about it. I mean, you know, I think to me, I, you know, again, I, and I don't have an exact answer to your question. I, I, I think, you know, in, in terms of um, in that respect, the, the, I mean, they're not, the, the type of torture that was going on at Guantanamo in, you know, 03, 04 is not uh, occurring anymore. <laughs> The, I mean, in my view, the, 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 the principal, the two interrelated principal problems at Guantanamo now are um, the, the, the prolonged uh, detention, um, you know, with that, and, and, and this indefinite nature, you know, the fact that it's just gone on and, and uh, you know, for so long without, with no finality, uh, one way or another, no assurance of when, if ever, people will go home. And, you know, and, and, and coupled with as well the isolation, which is still, although better, and there have been some improvements, still uh, significant. But it's really that indefinite nature of the det uh, detention. And I think when we, you know, think about, you know, the title today, I mean, justice, uh, progress for justice, I mean, what is justice? I mean, you know, I mean, justice is not, you know, simply what's happened, just locking people up um, in this open-ended system. It, it's, it's, it's a devastating um, uh, a thing, and I think that the um, the government is, is you know, the, there's it, it's sort of a continuing um, to de, you know defend um, this type of, of this system, and it's really to me that's the biggest um, you know the biggest problem uh, at Guantanamo. It's going on now. In fact, one of my uh, clients, who of uh, uh, Mohammed Jawad, who in, was before the military commissions, uh, and even in that flawed system, the government, um, uh, you know, the, the, was dealt blow after blow uh, by the military defense lawyer. Basically, their theory of the case went out that it was a war crime. Evidence was suppressed on the ground that it was obtained through torture. Uh, it was on, totally on life support at the, the case at the time Obama suspended the commission. So what, uh, has, what has the, the, the Justice Department done? Uh, obviously not uh, heeding Eric Holder's words that their job is to do justice. Uh, it, they've just gone in and defended the case in federal court, uh, offering in the same evidence that was suppressed uh, by the military judge, having spoken to no witnesses, 
uh, and just again prolonging um, the, the confinement. And you know, and then there's you know we can debate and you sit around and uh, and then there'll be new rules and maybe the commissions will come back and it just goes on and on. But I think it's just important when we think about justice to think about the, you know the, the 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 plight of the detainees and you know maybe some are guilty, but. Uh, it's, it's clear that many aren't and are just remain incarcerated and years have gone by. I mean, we're getting close to a decade without any finality uh, and we're just, you know, playing with the rules and we can talk about debating about the rules but what the reality is is, is cold, hard imprisonment uh, without end and there's just not been a fair and legitimate process and, I, you know, whether you call that torture or not uh, and whether it's legally torture, it sounds like torture to me. Can I, uh, yeah. I, let me talk specifically about the force feeding, which I have some limited knowledge. I have, haven't seen anybody force fed, but I have visited the medical facilities and had the procedure demonstrated to me. And, as, and, and I have seen it done in, in civilian medical facilities, and as far as I can ascertain, it's the identical procedure that's done in a civilian medical facility when you have somebody that's incapacitated and need to be fed. Um, it's understand there's very little pain or discomfort in the process. And, and, and the people that actually go through it don't resist and they do it. So I would really um, have a hard time figuring out how s you could, that would rise to the legal definition of, of torture. I'm, I'm just sharing, I, I mean, I, you, I'm sure you have. I'm just sharing my knowledge of, of what I know and what I've seen there. Um, you know, in terms of detention, I mean, we actually have pretty good scientific evidence that long term detention has deterious effects on mental health. You know, whether that rises to the, to the, to a statement of torture, and I mean, if it does, then you can't give anybody life in prison. Um, the, to me, what a reasonable, not, not a question of torture, but a reasonable question is, is, is what kind of mental health facilities are available to people that are being detained, and what kind of treatment are they getting? I think that's a fair medical issue. Uh, it's my understanding there is a mental, medic, uh, there is a mental health facility at, uh, at Guantanamo that is available to the detainees, and it is used. So I think there's a legitimate medical question there, but, uh, but again, I, I don't know how you could argue that it rises to the level of torture. Other questions, sir? I can't, I can't really see, ma'am. Great. No. Okay. Um, hi. Question for you. Um, okay. uh, looking beyond Guantanamo to uh, one of the issues raised by James at the end, to individuals who are picked up uh, outside of a traditional battlefield and who are being held indefinitely, we know many of them in Bagram. Um, and I guess my question is twofold. One, what do you think will happen to the Bagram detainee cases in the courts? And second, what do you think the administration will do with those folks or similarly situated people who may um, arise in the future, similar cases, and may, or alternately what you think should happen with those cases? Yeah. So Chris, Bagram's still a battlefield, right? Afghanistan, right? I think the more interesting question is Iraq. Is what you in Bagram were picked up outside right. of and that's, Afghanistan. And that's a, le that's a legitimate question. I, I, I think also the more interesting question is Iraq, because there's probably about 100 plus Al Qaeda detainees in Iraq where, where at some point uh, they're going to be up for, we're going to transfer those detainees over to the Iraqis, uh, and the Iraqis may choose to detain them or not. And these are bad guys, and if they just let them back on the street, they'll probably be a good violence. And the question is, is do they turn them back to the United States? If they turn back to the United States, what does the United States do with them? So, I think there's a lot of these. Um, there's a lot of these uh, future questions coming up, and there'll be other cases where you again you come up with detainees in a third-party country. What are you going to do them? We've already said we're not going to do rendition. Uh, you know, we're going to hold them in secret prisons. Um, you know, if you don't kill them and you're not going to put them in a court of law, what do you, you know? What are you going to do with them? And I just don't think that that we've got a real thought-out policy on this. And I and I don't understand why we're not devoting a lot more energy. Uh, and I know the administration's got a lot of, uh, on the table, and I know that the spotlight's on the 229 detainees, and that's where everybody's attention is, and that's where the bulk of their focus is. But I just don't think we're giving enough attention to these other issues, and they're, they're problems that are not going to go away. And if we don't get them right, you know, we're going to be right back defending ourselves like we were at Guantanamo six or seven years ago when people don't start to like American policies again. And I think it's very short-sighted that we're not spending more attention on this issue right now. I think, um, <laughs> with respect to the last point, I, the administration is devoting an enormous amount, of, enormous amount of time to detainee issues, not just to Guantanamo. They've got, you know, they've got their own Guantanamo task force, and they have a separate task force that's, that's devoted entirely to Afghanistan and everywhere else on the planet, in addition to Guantanamo. So, um, I, I just, 
they, they, I, I'd be concerned if they were devoting more time than they already are <laughs> um, to detainee issues. Um, uh, with respect to detainees picked up you know, elsewhere, uh, Indonesia, Bosnia, and so forth. Some of these, you know, showed up in Guantanamo. This is an ongoing question, and so forth. Um, I think that's a, it, I think that's a critical question. Right now, the litigation position that the administration has taken um, in the Guantanamo uh, cases and the uh, interpretation that they've won on uh, for the scope of the authorization for the use of military force in one now in several district court decisions uh, is uh, authorization that would extend uh, to anybody who fits this definition. Some, in most district courts, it's some combination of membership in al-Qaeda plus indication of participation in hostilities and so forth. It doesn't matter under that definition, uh, most of the courts, where the person is picked up um, if they satisfy these criteria under the AOMF as construed, you know, consistent sort of with international law, then, uh, then that would extend. That's the, that's the way things sit right now. I think um, that it, it is an untenable and untenably sustainable and sustainable position to take going forward. I think it's one thing to take that position sort of as a litigating position, resolving the Guantanamo mess and so forth. If you want to use the authorization for the use of military force sort of going forward as ample uh, congressional, uh, amply clear congressional statement, this is meant to authorize an ongoing preventive detention regime, which is actually well beyond what is kind of traditional armed conflict setting, uh, then I think you're confronting enormous due process challenges under U.S. constitutional law, legality challenges under international law, um, and I think, I think that's a subject of enormous concern, and I think that's what's driving the, the push to legislate about this, not just litigate it. That said, I think it would be an enormous, um, both legal, but also strategic, and probably more important uh, from the counterterrorism point of view, an enormous strategic mistake to decide that what we are going to do with people, we pick up individuals, any country, anywhere on the planet, who we think sort of satisfy this, this definition, is to detain them uh, under a system in which the conditions for their release remain essentially unclear. I think that uh, kind of system won't pass constitutional scrutiny. And I think, uh, despite what Jay said and described as sort of dismissively the problems of public diplomacy surrounding Guantanamo and these practices, it's not just a very real problem of public diplomacy, the counter to which we are now wit witnessed in Lebanon are now witnessing in Iran um, when, when the opposite position is taken, but was an incredibly acute problem of counterterrorism operations. Our policy in Guantanamo, our policy of detainee treatment, et cetera, led the British, among others, to decide they didn't want to engage in joint counterterrorism operations with us, with our Navy and so forth, um, as a result of the way we had treated uh, detainees. Uh, uh, Alberto Mora testified to this before Congress. General Pet Petraeus has made the same claim. Um, I, I, think, I think there is no question of the actual acute effect, negative effect, on our strategic counterterrorism interests. And I think an ongoing practice of this, sort of globally unconstrained, is one that, that uh, will be very hard-pressed to uh, justify in the face of that kind of, uh, that kind of response. Um, by the way, way we were in the penalty box. You, you would not believe. Way over time, um, the the moot court is coming in here. If you'll come up to the front, we'll continue the discussion. And I want to thank the panelists, and they'll be here to continue talking. <laughs>